morning. The mindfulness bell calls us out of our preoccupations, even joyful preoccupations. There's a lot of joy in here this morning. Calls us out of all of our preoccupations with our, involved with our worldly existence and invites us to be fully present in one silent minute. Well, I've never heard an arrangement of Wondrous Love. Do you recognize the tune? That was beautiful. Do you know anything about Mar Jordan? A church pianist and writer, Mar, that's an interesting first name, Mar Jordan. Well, thank you, Mar Jordan. Living or dead, do you have any idea? Is still alive or, you know, contemporary? Yeah. Wow, that was beautiful. Well, welcome everybody and welcome in person as well as those persons joining us on social media via Facebook Live at the moment. I just posted this morning about a song you're going to hear in just about a second. I quoted the first verse of it when I posted this morning. So um, uh, welcome and if you're seeing this on a YouTube link sometime later on in this week or whenever, uh, you're welcome now and you're welcome then in the eternity of the spirit and in the eternity of the social media here. So we're in Lent. We're in the second week of Lent. Lent is the period of time that leads up to Easter, just like Advent is the period of time that leads up to Christmas. Get that? Advent leads to Christmas. Lent leads to Easter. And these candelabras, if you can see them on social media, also on the end of the pews are put up just for Christmas. And they were handmade by a guy a long, long, long time ago for his daughter's wedding. And we bring them out and then we put them away. And I really like them. So we came up with the idea to keep them up. And then Rochelle Schmidt came up with the idea of 
As long as we're keeping them up, can we put some spring-like flowers, like Easter-like flowers on them? And I said, sure. And then she told me this morning, predictably, there are people who are saying, well, would you mind changing those to like, gold and yellow in the fall? And then, of course, we'll change them to Christmas. And she said, sure. I said, let no good deed go unrecognized. So thank you very much to that. <laughs> and also, those who are in person, and there's a little incentive to be in person if you can, uh, obviously, Jerry Manike, San Diego, Nancy Minsky, North Carolina, you're not going to be coming here. But in the reception room, uh, I haven't even talked to her about it. I assume Tex and Aaron Kelly put up that puzzle. And it's like everybody from the congregation is invited to go put a piece, and everybody gets a piece. And then eventually it's the puzzle that's been put together, each piece by members of the congregation. Did I intuit that correctly? Good work there, and also tons of refreshments. From and she brought in beautiful decorations. I haven't even really been in that room except for walking through to the men's room, to be honest with you. So I'll look at the decorations later. Anyway, a lot going on this time of year, some really, really good stuff as well. In the confirmation class during communion Sundays, which is the first Sunday of each month, is staying with us instead of going back to the Sunday school. So it's really nice to see your thoroughly bored faces this morning. It's very, very comforting and reassuring. It feels so familiar. It feels like Tuesday night. So, any other announcements I've missed that I should make? Okay, very good. So now is the song that I've been posting about on social media this morning by Johnny Nash, not Johnny Cash. <laughs> I'm looking at Maury, he knows this very well. But Johnny Nash, and it's a song that, after all the rain and everything, and we had some snow, I think it's a perfect song. What do you think, Craig? I'm going to go down there and listen to it.
Not too shabby. Not too shabby at all. Not too shabby. Bill is beautiful, beautiful. Lifted my spirits. How about you guys? Yeah? The morning prayer is printed in this morning's bulletin as well as online, so you can uh, recite it even if you're alone in a room. Once we say, like one thing I like about the 2,000-some-year-old uh, Lord's Prayer, and this is not it, is that people have been praying this in unison at any time on a Sunday morning or probably any time during the week. You're probably saying that prayer with other people. So even if you're home alone, you're joining it with us, and you're also joining it with the whole world. And it resonates out these prayers. I am absolutely convinced about that. You're listening to me, Nancy Minsky, who asked me as she's dealing dealing with the, uh, uh, her husband who's uh, having some very serious health issues, talking about prayer. Well, one thing good about prayer is it works, and it especially works for the one doing the praying. That I know. Sometimes the consequences and the results of the prayer, I prayed for this and the bad happened anyway. Sometimes that happens. That doesn't mean that the prayer is rendered ineffective. Prayer converts and transforms the spirit of the one doing the praying. If I'm wrong, let me know, because we're going to pray aloud and together right now, the morning prayer as is printed in this morning's bulletin and on your screens online. Loving Lord, and glorious God, thank you for the day we were born. Thank you for every day since then that we are reborn from the womb of night. Thank you for being able to begin again, to start over, to begin our day anew at any moment we wish. Thank you for the emergence of hope from the tomb of hopelessness. This is the day the Lord has made and has blessed us with the opportunity to rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. And now we have the Lent banner, which is uh, up every week during Lent as well. And Beth Marvin is going to read about the Lent banner emblem for the second week of Lent. Good morning. For many years, we have displayed the Lenten banner that is to my left. Some people seated here this morning contributed to making the banner and the symbols placed upon it. Each week of Lent, we place an additional symbol on the banner. Last week, the first Sunday in Lent, we placed the symbol of the towel and basin upon the banner. It represents how Jesus came not to be served by others, but serve others. The second week of Lent, we place the symbol of the rooster on the Lenten banner. The rooster reminds us of Peter, a disciple who claimed he would be loyal and loving of Jesus even unto death. But Jesus warned Peter that before the rooster crowed at the arrival of dawn, Peter would have denied Jesus three times. Peter was astonished and hurt that Jesus would think that he would deny him. And yet, after Jesus was arrested, Peter did deny three times that he knew Jesus. After the third denial came the sound of the rooster, reminding him of his broken promise to the Christ to remain faithful. Peter sank to his knees and wept. This story about a man and a rooster is really about us. It reminds us that words of love and devotion roll easily off of our lips during times of pleasure and plenty, but that the true test of discipleship is whether we will remain loyal when a sacrificial gift is demanded of us. This story reminds us of our own denial of responsibility and reluctance to offer assistance to each other and to Christ's church as we turn away, as we turn our face away from the dawning realization that our silence and refusal to help has contributed to the suffering of others. But Peter learned from his mistake. It was too late for Peter to help save Jesus, but it was not too late for him to help save the church. Nor is it too late for us to do the same. Peter asked for forgiveness and was forgiven, just as we too may ask for forgiveness and be forgiven. 
Peter, the one who abandoned Jesus when the going gets tough, went on to fulfill his mission as summed up by Jesus when he said, referring to Peter, Upon this rock I will build my church. And upon us, the rocks, the foundation, the body of Christ, and the Peters of this world, the church continues to be built and maintained. Uh, if you guys could come down, just you can go back to, uh, to wherever you're sitting, but the young persons, if you could come up here, younger persons, just for a minute. I was listening to, I wrote that thing that, that, that uh, Beth just recited, but um, I listened to it with new ears. I wrote it, and I was reading it saying, boy, that's really good. And I went, oh, I wrote that. No wonder it's so good. Oh, don't hurry. Don't hurry, Madison. The slower, the better, you know, just like molasses. It eventually gets out of the jar. Thanks. Okay, so what did I say in the bulletin I was going to be talking to you about starting over, I think it says, right? Okay, so this may sound like a trick question, and in a way it is, but you'll understand because I don't make fun of you guys or play tricks. Or, 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 I do really don't. Do I? You, Aaron's laughing. Maybe I do. Um, who is the oldest one amongst you? You don't know, really, exactly. There's a saying amongst some spiritual people, the person who got up first this morning. Now, what in the world does that mean? Any idea? So I thought smirking, giggling, looking at me sideways, that would be a sign of like, oh, I get it. So the person who's the oldest is the one who got up earliest this morning. Okay? Now, during the sermon, you're going to be hearing something about, it, about this. Jesus really messed with our conception of time. And uh, Dennis, do you have any idea what that might, might, I'm picking on this guy, this is not a plan, what that might mean when somebody says, who's the oldest one, the one who, got, and, and the answer is the one who got up earliest this morning, any clue about what that might mean? If you, if, I'm not going to put a microphone in your face for you to say no. You think so? Okay, hold on a second. Okay, Dennis? Yeah, maybe every day is like starting all over again, like dead. Every day is like starting all over again, like being born each day. So that's sort of what you're going to be hearing about through the course of the day. Are you ticklish? Oh, my gosh, she's not awake. Okay, now, the next thing, let's move on. In what Beth Marvin just read about the Lent banner, I thought, oh, my gosh. This, one of the lines is this story about the rooster saying, I don't know you and denying, uh, uh, pretending you don't know somebody. Pretending like it didn't happen. Checking out, in other words. This story reminds us of our own denial and reluctance to offer assistance to each other and to the church as we turn our face away from the dawning realization that our silence and refusal to help has contributed to the suffering of others. So if somebody's suffering, you don't have to be the one who's making them suffer, but your silence and refusal to act is part of that person's suffering. That's what Jesus was saying. You are responsible to each other. Where one person suffers, everybody suffers. Where one person celebrates, Everybody celebrates. So I thought that ties in exactly with what I want Joe Bradley and Maury Dean and Tony Dean even, if she wants to come over here. I think Maury uh, has something in his pocket. 
But you know when you bring in um, food? That food is handed out by Joe Bradley and his wife, Jan Bradley, who had some very serious surgery to her jaws, and now she had a bit of a complication. She's back in the hospital, and she's worried about the food pantry. In a hospital with her mouth wired shut, she's worried about whether she can eat, but she's worried about whether other people can eat. That's a loving person. We never see her. She doesn't get paid. She doesn't ask for thanks. She hands out. Lorraine does that also. Uh, Corinne Kusta is online, I bet, and she comes in periodically to do it. So does Tom Savastano, who hands out food pantry on th- uh, the food groceries on Thursdays. So they all are working behind the scenes when the church isn't open and there's no microphone or robe or, or lights for them, but they do it nonetheless. And Tony, who you know, Miss Tony Dean, who is a, uh, the one in charge of the children's library, came up with this idea years ago, right? And what was the idea? Well, the idea is pennies to the pantry. And if we all work together and take the change out of our pockets, it's getting kind of heavy, and drop it in the jar together, maybe we can help. So I today would like to present to you the results of all these pennies for the pantry. And how much money do you have? Well, this one, I had to move Miss Maury to help carry the jar because it was so heavy. Thank you all. Uh, this has $76 in it. And I believe Dwight had some taken from it before. Well, yeah, but I needed some gas and a new shirt. Uh, so, uh, you know, I'll catch up with you later. No, we do. But that idea began with Miss Tony Dean. Mrs. Tony Dean. I mean, this is a Southern thing. Everybody's Miss Tony, Miss Barbara, Miss Chris, you know, uh, Miss Anna. So that's a Southern thing. It's not disrespectful. Mrs. Dean. Um, I, you know, I don't call women by their first name. It's impolite. And I don't encourage children to do the same either. That's my ministry in the South. Different story. But thank you for the correction. So Mrs. Tony Dean came up with the idea of of the pennies. But it would be done by you guys. That would be initiated. We had Madison walking around with the jar collecting money. And at the spirituality of the blues, at night on a Sunday night, we had the jar on the refreshment table. So... I don't think, I don't know if I contributed a single dollar to this personally, but we come up with another $154. So I can't do the math. 154 plus 79 or something? 76. So we would like to give this money to, to Joe, Mr. Joe Bradley, who's going to pass it off to our treasurer to put it in the bank so that they can use that bank account to buy the groceries. So, you know, do you like that? What do you think? Very nice. Thank you. Yeah, he's a man of many words. You just can't shut the guy up, you know? Okay. <laughs> so I just wanted you to see who's behind there. And I want the congregation to see that this isn't – what I liked about it is originally is that, you, you know, pennies, just pennies. And I was thinking, oh, my gosh, who even carries pennies nowadays? And then look at what happened. And it because it's with the seed of that tree that is grown has been you guys. Tony comes up, Miss Tony comes up with the idea. You come up with walking it around. The jar has been sitting there. It's taken a little while. So, Mr. Bradley, we'd like to give you the 76 or 74. I keep thinking 76 trombones. And the 74 and that. And then you can give it to Kathy. And God bless your wife, who's very active in the food pantry, and everybody else here who takes a part of it. Thank you very much for helping to feed. This is not true for you guys. That, that Sometimes we deny, we walk away from people who are hungry and needy. And we've just seen how a little way pennies in a jar has turned into a couple hundred bucks, which is a lot of groceries for people. Some of them have a hot plate. They cook the pasta, they pour out the water, they put a jar of sauce in, mix it up, and that's their dinner. 
It sounds very simple. It is. It sounds like poverty. It is. But it sounds like love to me. It's because of you guys and you guys, and I'm very blessed as a pastor of this church, and I also want to give you a personal thanks. God bless you. Peace. We, we heard an instrumental version of Wondrous Love um, at just that opened up the service, and so now we're going to continue that with the, uh, the Wondrous Love over here, baby. All of these wonderful people in the choir who are going to knock it out for us. Let's go. So I tell you about the Message Bible a lot, and I've been reading from it a lot lately. There's hundreds of Bibles, different versions. The Message Bible I like because it's very much in common language that people from the street can get. Simple message. So let's see if it works again. The story of Nicodemus. Uh, Interesting story that we're unpacking. It was already unpacked a little bit with the younger ones that we were talking about. And it is further unpacked now as we read from... 
the third chapter of John, verses 1 through 15. There was a man of the Pharisee sect, Nicodemus, a prominent leader among the Jews. Late one night, he visited Jesus and said, Rabbi, we all know you're a teacher straight from God. No one could do the God-revealing acts you do if God weren't in on it. And Jesus said, You're absolutely right. Take it from me. Unless a person is born from above, it's not possible to see what I'm pointing to, to God's kingdom. How can anyone, said Nicodemus, be born who has already been born and has grown up? You can't re-enter your mother's womb and be born again. What are you saying with this born-from-above talk? And Jesus said, You're not listening. Let me say it again. Unless a person submits to this original creation, the wind hovering over the water creation, the invisible moving creation, uh, visible, uh, the wind hovering over the water creation, the invisible moving visible, a baptism into new life, it's not possible to enter God's kingdom. When you look at a baby, it's just that. The baby is a body you can look at and touch. But the person who takes shape within its mother is formed by something you can't see and touch, the spirit. It becomes a living spirit. So don't be so surprised when I tell you that you have to be born from above, out of this world, so to speak. You know well enough how the wind blows this way and that. You hear it rustling through the trees, but you have no idea where it comes from or where it's headed next. That, that's the way it is with everyone born from above, by the wind of God, the Spirit of God. Nicodemus still didn't get it. What do you mean by this? How does this happen? And Jesus said, You're a respected teacher of Israel, and you don't know these basics? Listen carefully. I'm speaking sober truth to you. I speak only of what I know by experience. I give witness only to what I have seen by my own eyes. There is nothing secondhand here, no hearsay. Yet instead of facing the evidence and accepting it, you procrastinate with questions. If I tell you things that are plain as the hand before your face, and you don't believe me, what use is there telling you of things you can't see? The things of God? No one has ever gone up into the presence of God, except the one who came down from the presence, the Son of Man, in the same way that Moses lifted the spirit, the serpent, in the desert, so people could have something to see and then believe, it is necessary for the Son of Man to be lifted up. And everyone who looks up to him, trusting and expectant, will gain a real life, eternal life. This is how much God loved the world. He gave his son, the one and only son. And this is why, so that no one need be destroyed. By believing in him, anyone can have a whole and lasting life. God didn't go all to all the trouble of sending his son merely to point out an accusing finger telling the world how bad it was. He came to help to put the world right again. Thank you, Rick. Well, there's a lot of words. It's a lot of words. It's, you know, I had talked earlier in Lent, what happens during Lent that doesn't happen in the run-up to Christmas. In the run-up to Easter, as we see... Jesus doing all these miracles, like Nicodemus did. 
but we also are getting in touch with the mystical Christ, the Christ that people just, was it was mind-blowing then, and it's mind-blowing now. And some people, rather than going up to the level where they can comprehend this mysticism of the Christ, try to defuse it and bring it down. You know, it's like it's easier to pull somebody down into the pit than it is for, to, for you to climb out of it. You've heard that saying, I'm sure. Or if have, you haven't, it, it's about time you did. So rather than going up there and trying to un- understand his mysticism, we bring it down to Jesus the carpenter. Keep it real simple. He did this. He did that. He suffered. He died. Okay, we get that. We get that. But the other stuff, the transfiguration and stuff, is really mystical stuff that begs us to to unpack it. So, Nicodemus. Reminded me of Nicorette gum. You know, nicotine, Nicor Nicodemus. What in the world is this when I read this the first time? Nicodemus was an, an, an esteemed leader of Israel. So, he was Jewish like Jesus and everybody else of the early Christians. They were all Jewish. So, he was an esteemed leader of Israel who came to Jesus and said, as we heard, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher who has come from God. In other words, I get it. You are the real deal. You have come from God. Nicodemus gets it. Or so he thinks. This is where it gets mystical and why it's hard to understand it. Why the Message Bible said, let's try to bring it down. And it's still difficult to comprehend. So Nicodemus gets it. We know you're a teacher, meaning rabbi, who has come from God. You're the real deal. You have a direct link to the big one upstairs. And I get it. Or so he thinks. Why does he get it? He had heard stories about Rabbi Jesus raising people from the dead, turning water into wine, curing blindness, and walking on water. These miracles proved to Nicodemus that Jesus has come from God. Makes sense, right? He's got to come from God. Look at this stuff he's doing. This is where I think, partly, it proves to me that Jesus was the real deal. Because you can't put stories like this in a Bible and expect people to sign on to the, the lie, you know, the propaganda. We're only in it for your money, and then we're going to tell you these stories, and you'll feel terrible and cough up all your... If if you're going to do something like that, why would you put in a story like this? I'll tell you what I mean. So Nicodemus says, you're the real deal. You're the Messiah. You come from God. I've seen the healings. I get it. I'm a leader of Israel, devout Jew, one of the Pharisees. And Jesus says, instead of affirming that, well, thank you. Where's your check? And uh, if you're going to cook dinner, I like steak and lobster. Instead of doing that, instead of affirming Nicodemus' declaration of his divine origin, instead of that, Jesus challenges Nicodemus lovingly. But instead of taking the glory, you're the best preacher I've ever heard in my life. Yeah, well, thank you. You get it. Instead of that, he challenges him and says, No one can see the kingdom of God. You think you're seeing the kingdom of God in me. And I'm telling you, fair and good man, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they're born again. That was not the answer Nicodemus was looking for. He didn't know what Jesus was talking about. How can a man, as he says in the scripture, Can you imagine you want to write a book of propaganda and you talk about somebody climbing back into the womb and getting born again? This is like, what? But that's what, that's what, Nicodemus is scratching his head figuratively. He he didn't know what he's talking about. How can a man be born again when he's already emerged from his mother's womb? This is one miracle that Nicodemus cannot comprehend. Born again. Who's the oldest? The one who got up earliest this morning. What does that talk about? Dennis got it. I know a bit about Dennis's spiritual journey. That's why I had a feeling he would he would get it. 
Jesus tells Nicodemus that the kingdom of God is not about miracles. The kingdom of God is not about me walking on water, curing blindness, raising the dead, uh, telling a woman whose daughter is bleeding to death to go home because she's been cured. All of that magnificence is not what the kingdom of God is about. Thank you for noticing it, but that's not what we're talking about. The kingdom of God that Jesus was talking about is about spiritual transformation, restructuring the world order, and starting life all over again. Perhaps even each day, like Dennis was saying, the one who got up earliest this morning is the oldest because we start each day anew. Each day can be a new life. And if you are really in the, 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 the doldrums of life because of something, and you're walking around bitter and angry and resentful and barking at everybody and, you know, lipping off to the waiter, and, you know, it's like, oh, man, what am I doing? You can start your day right over at 2.32 in the afternoon on a Tuesday. Start the day over. This day begins anew. Start it over. Wash the slate clean of everything that has happened so far and begin anew. That's, in the, that's sort of what you can do, because we're living in the moment if we're living at all. If we're living in the past, and we're living in the future, but we're not, then we can't be present in the moment. As a, one of my spiritual colleagues said to me about a year or two ago, I was com- saying something I was worried about, and he said, yeah, Dwight, today is the tomorrow you worried about yesterday. Today is the tomorrow you worried about yesterday. Live in the moment. Live in the moment. Give it up. Stop suffering. Stop thinking. It is the, 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 the spirit that he's talking about and the, the kingdom of God he's talking about is not in the body. The body is a temple and we should take care of it because it's within us, this body temple, that life exists. What he's talking about is spirit. Nicodemus can't claim the spirit because he sees it in Jesus. You see the workings of God in me, but that doesn't help you, is what Jesus is saying. Lovingly and blowing this guy's mind. Nicodemus, I can hear him saying, you have to see it in yourself. The kingdom of God is within, Jesus said repeatedly. If you see the workings of God in me, you're going to build some altar to me. And you're still going to be decrepit and bitter and lonely. You need to see this miracle, this kind of spirituality, in yourself, if you can see it in me, you have the ability to see it in yourself. Jesus tells Nicodemus then that God so loved the world. And we love this line, right? God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Well, I have a son. I have one son of my children. One's a boy. I so love the world that I allowed my son to sacrifice. That doesn't make any sense. Unless I so loved the world, I allowed my son to enlist, knowing what might happen. That's another form of this kind of spirit and giving that Jesus the Christ is talking about. Reframe it a little bit, like I just did with the enlistment. Jesus tells Nicodemus that God so loved the world that he gave us someone to believe in, and through this belief we can experience the eternity of the Spirit in ourself. In other words, all of this mysticism and all of the transfiguration where he reveals what he's like and he starts shining like alabaster or like the gown uh, most mother of pearl like that you'll see in his gown on that stained glass window, which is a magnificent piece of art. If you've ever stand in front of that, you'll be meditating for as long as you can handle it. 
And then, then they say, oh, let's stay here forever. Remember, that this is last week, this mystical experience. We want to keep it going. He says, no, you've got to go back down into the streets. You've got to go back to Jerusalem, lead, lead your life. Pay your bills, take care of your kids, you know, plant the seeds for the harvest. But how do you see this mysticism? Jesus says to Nicodemus, essentially, he didn't use the word I, I came, God sent a human form embodying the divinity that exists in the world, the spiritual realm that exists in our midst. We're more, you know, somebody says we're human beings having a spiritual experience. Other people said, no, we're spiritual beings having a human experience. Very different way of looking at the same thing. That's another head scratcher. We're not so much a human being having a spiritual experience. We're spiritual beings. We're born of the Spirit. And we're having a human experience as long as we're on earth. So people weren't getting it. Clearly, the, the, the good, wonderful, devout people of the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament, living in caves and writing Scripture down and uh, translating it from uh, Latin to Greek to da, 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 Aramaic, uh, that Jesus spoke English. And then we have a world that's messed up and Israel's ripped in half and people are just slaughtering each other. So, well, I don't guess they didn't get it. And so, well, I'll send another person. I'll send my message embodied in a human being so that instead of looking at a mystical thing that you can't comprehend, you can look at a human being, Jesus, and the travails. But the challenge is to look not so much at Jesus, but to look through Jesus. You understanding this at all? It's like when I look at somebody, they, they, I, my training, my spiritual training, that preceded my Christianity, which I became, I was baptized at 43, was that when you look at someone Look for the God within them. And don't stop at the stupid stuff. Like, this guy's homeless and smells bad, and I don't trust him, and I don't want to shake hands, so I'm going to get... Okay, that all might be true. It might not. Look at where's the God in this person I really love. Where's the God in this person I can't stand? You know, I want to get away from this person as soon as possible. They're insulting me on top of it. I want, I'm, you know, like, I'm done with this guy. Where's the God in this person? Where's the God in this transaction? Where's the God in me? Somebody said to me, another one of my spiritual teachers said, it, it was in a, in a conversation, and I just, it was one line in about a 30 minute lecture. And I, I picked up on it like that. She was talking about when she goes to the grocery store and she holds the door open for somebody who walks through and they don't say thank you. And what she, oh, you're smirking. Have you had that experience? Or have your kids had that experience? How about that? That annoys me. It annoys everybody. That's our human existence. It annoys, oh, it never annoys me. Don't lie in the pulpit, Dwight. Okay, that annoys me too. I tell you what I've done, confession of sin, you know, like, Confession is not a Catholic thing. We know that, right? It's an urge to confess, to unburden ourselves. Everybody has this. You're welcome. There goes that good deed. You know, they don't even turn around and say, ah, shut up, you know. They just, oh, and I, and I just stand there having done the right thing and I feel bad. Now, what's that about? And this woman said, when that happens, just pause and say, Lord, bless her, change me. Bless her, change me. I opened the door because she looked like she couldn't open the door by herself. Now I want, what, a parade? A cake? A $50 bill? A thank you note? What a... For doing what any decent person should do, I want to have a, a stool and a, and a light and a microphone, and because I did, did, bless you, change me, God, change me from this. I need some acknowledgement. You know, Jesus 
did this every day. The food pantry, Joe, are you still here? I thought that he might have gone back to be with his wife. He's sticking around because I gave him, you know, you can duck out. Oh, his wife's in the hospital, so she's not even home anymore. So he's still here. But, you know, like, bless you, Joe. Bless you, Tony, for doing this stuff. Change me if I feel like it's not enough or it's not right or we should have brought in more money. All of that nonsense. That's the human response. That's me not getting the Christ. The kingdom of God is not about miracles. It's spiritual transformation, restructuring the world order that says we need to get back or else we're going to withhold. If you love and they don't love you back, then withhold love from them. Or what about Jesus might say, if you love them, they don't love you back, love them more. Bless them and change me for saying I deserve your love or whatever I'm thinking. It's not about the body, but it's about the spirit. Nicodemus can't claim the spirit by seeing it in Jesus. He has to see it from himself. And when he does, that is being born again. Born again Christians, the evangelicals, this is what they're talking about. The conversion that happens. The conversion of spirit. It says, I have been changed. I have been born anew. Anybody and I'm oh, I was looking around saying, is there anybody in 12-step recovery? It's like, Dwight, please. Anybody who has a wart that they'd like to tell us about? You know, like, you know, certain people get it. If you have had remission from a life-threatening disease, you get it. If you're in recovery from an addiction, you get it. Start over. Recalibrate. Let go of the past. Make a t- amendments and atone for your mistakes. Do your confession. And if it's not received well, you did your part. And then just walk away. Thankfully. Don't expect or demand that they, that when you say, I, did, I was wrong in this argument, and they don't say, well, I was wrong too, honey. You say, see, this is why I don't bother saying I'm wrong, because you never say it back to me. You know, all of that, let it go. Jesus tells Nicodemus, God so loved the world, he gave us someone to see, to believe in. And through this person, we see in experience the eternity of the Spirit. If it's in you, it's got to be in me. If I can see it in Jesus, it's got to be in me. Or I wouldn't see it. You following this? I wouldn't see it. If, if I wasn't able to lead that kind of life, I wouldn't even see it. And if I can see it, even if I'm not doing it or believing it, there is the possibility of a spiritual transformation. We drop the body at death. We take on the body when we're born, or even before we're born, we have the body. And we drop the body at death, and the spirit moves on. The body dies, the spirit remains. And as Jesus said to Nicodemus, to help him again understand it, the wind blows wherever it chooses. And you can hear the sound of the wind, but you don't know where it's coming from, and you don't know where it's going. The Spirit is like that. And in Hebrew, the word ruach, means spirit, but it also means breath and wind. The the wind blows wherever it chooses. You can feel it. You can smell the fresh air sometimes. It blows back your hair. You don't know where it's coming from. You don't know where it's going next. That's exactly like the spirit. You can't hold on to it. And that's why some people want to ignore it. They can't measure it, proclaim it. Now, Stephen Martin over here, raise your hand. Before the service, he's always, you know, challenging me. Before I even get into my robes, he's challenging me about the the reading that's coming up. He said, well, didn't Nicodemus have anything else to say? And I said, well, he probably did. He probably said, "Um, this chicken is not fully cooked. He probably said, hey, kids, if you don't get in the house, you're going to be really sorry. 
He probably said lots of things, but this is what is in the Bible because it shows us how spiritual transformation happens in the world through the Christ for us 2,000 years later. Interestingly, we never hear from Nicodemus again. That's it. The first and last time we ever hear from him is at this juncture. I'm in. You're the man. Because you don't even know who you are, and you don't know who I am. But that's a great question, so I'll unpack it for you. We don't know where he went with this. Nicodemus might have walked away and said, well, I changed my mind. That guy's nuts. You know, it's like the wind, and blah, 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 and you're born again. And it's just like, I thought, you know, I must have been crazy. Following this. Or he might have gone back to continue the message. You know who I just met? You know what he just told me? Like the woman, I don't even know her name, who said, bless you, change me, when you do this selfish, supposedly spiritual stuff. It's not working, Dwight. It will never work because it's about you. It can't be about you because it's not about you. The blessing is you do something right, period, and you let it go. And if they don't do their part or what you think their part is, it's none of your business. Do the right thing. Through Nicodemus, Jesus shows us that we can be born again and again and again, every day into a new realm of possibility, a new way of thinking, a new way of seeing, a new way of believing. You ever heard of the Buddhist monk Thich Nhat Hanh? Thich Nhat Hanh? He died relatively recently into his 90s. He was on, uh, being interviewed by Oprah Winfrey, and she said... Um, uh, well, he was old then, and she said, well, so what are you working on? Are you working on anything? And he just looked at her like he didn't know what she was talking about. You don't get on Oprah's show. It was in her garden in the backyard of this mega mansion somewhere. What am I working on? He said, well, I'm not working on anything. It's like, I don't work on things. I just, I do. I, I see, I hear, I walk, I eat, I sleep. But what am I working on? I'm not working on anything. And then she said, well, are you afraid of dying? Oh, no, no, no. I die probably around 400 times a day. That was his answer. I die 400 times a day. Now, you can change the channel. See, that makes nonsense. Or I thought, oh, I get it. Each moment is gone. The only moment we have Today is the tomorrow you worried about yesterday. This is all we've got. I get it, but I don't get it. 400 times a day, he lets go of who he was, and he becomes who he is. And then the moment after that, the same thing happens. I saw Thich Nhat Hanh at the Riverside Church once. He did a walk, a two-block walk, from a place in the Riverside Park up Riverside Avenue and into the Riverside Church to give his talk. And you were invited to come and follow him on this walk. A lot of people did. Two blocks. It took three hours. And some people just left. Three hours. He would stop and he would feel trees and he, he was just in the moment. And the New York Times reporter was waiting for him. He was very late and getting ticked off in this room where the New York Times and Thich Nhat Hanh uh, were, uh, to, and he was going to speak downstairs in the church, was waiting for him. And he said, the door knob turned. He said, finally, the door opened. Thich Nhat Hanh walked in, closed the door behind him, and started walking toward the table. He said, before he took three steps, I knew he was the real deal. Just, he was so in that moment, nothing else existed but the moment in which he was existing. That, I believe, now he's a Buddhist, Jesus was not a Christian, you who never heard the word, Jesus was a Jew, Thich Nhat Hanh was a Buddhist, I'm a Christian, same message. The eternity of the Spirit is now, it dwells within you. And you can see it manifest in countless places in the world. But don't cling, because as soon as you cling, that moment will be dead to you. 
So, Lent is clearly a time of introspection. There's no away in the manger, no crib for a bed. The little Lord Jesus laid down his sweet head. The Gospel of Mark has no birth narrative. Mark could care less about the manger, the three wise men. Never mentioned it. Mark's Gospel begins at Jesus' baptism. Why? Because that's when the Spirit in the form of a dove came down and he rose up out of the water. And God says, this is my beloved Son and with whom I'm most proud. God, Spirit, Son. There's your Trinity. That's where Mark's Gospel begins. And this moment is where this day begins and ends, and this sermon begins and ends with these two sentences. Lent is a time of introspection, and Christ is with you on your spiritual journey from the darkness of Lent all the way through and beyond the light of Easter. Money. Your financial gifts are gratefully received. Obviously, this place doesn't pay for itself. If you are unable to contribute financially for whatever reason, your presence is a gift unto us, and it is well received. If you have something to offer at the moment, some of Tony's pennies or whatever, the ushers, come on, you can start already now. Uh, We'll be taking your collection. uh, collection. If not, let her rip. And if you're online, as you may know, churchonmainstreet.org. Upper right-hand corner of the page, donate. Click that donate button that takes you to PayPal. Okay, churchonmainstreet.org. Put something in the basket now or be a blessing and a gift unto us.
On the night before he died, Jesus went soon in this liturgical year, it's called Monday Thursday, it's the night of the Last Supper, and at this Last Supper, of the, night, the, the, the Last Supper he had on earth, Jesus went into the upper room with the disciples and began to tell them, let's celebrate the Passover. They're all Jews, of course, Jesus is a rabbi, who's the Passover Seder. And at the Seder, Jesus said, I am the bread of life, and you who come to me shall not hunger, and you who believe in me shall never thirst. And in company with all who hunger and thirst for spiritual food, you're welcome in a moment to come forward. So on the night before he died, Jesus took the bread, gave God thanks, broke the bread, and gave it to the disciples, saying, this is my body, given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, Jesus took the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. A new world order is upon us. A new way of being. The cup of blessing, some people call it, rather than the cup of blood or the blood of Christ. Some people call it the cup of blessing. Some people call this the staff of life. Whatever you call it, it is how we remember the reality of the risen and very present God in our midst. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us. Come to us in the broken bread and the cup, so that all who share this feast may be one through Christ, with Christ, and in Christ. Through the broken bread we participate in the body, through the cup of blessing, we participate in the Spirit. The gifts of God for the people of God come, for all things are ready. <laughs>
Now, as is the tradition of this church and many, many churches for the last couple thousand years, we recite what has come to be known as the Lord's Prayer. We do so knowing that there are many, many versions of the Lord's Prayer as there are many, many versions of the Bible. So there are different words that we may use, trespasses, sins, debts. Some persons of Catholic persuasion still do not recite the last line, whatever version of the Lord's Prayer you wish. In this soup of words that we are about to have, different meters, different words, different timing, we, in this cacophony of words, also are present to the Spirit of the Christ as we pray aloud and together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom be Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now we're going to do a hymn, which I will probably butcher. You're free to join me if you wish. Stand if you wish. The hymn, the lyrics are, are they online, Will? The lyrics are on your screen, and they're also in your bulletin. As Moses raised the serpent up. If you don't get it, move your lips. We won't know the difference. Or listen to the first verse and then join us from the other ones, whatever makes you most comfortable. Rise if you are able. Remain seated if you prefer. the postlude, and then to put a puzzle together in the reception room for the first time in 14 years that I've been here, and of course, to Nosh. Um, Aaron Kelly, was that homemade bread? Was that homemade bread? That uh, communion bread was homemade bread uh, made by Aaron Kelly, so uh, thank you for, uh, I, you know, she gets it. She When she's baking the bread, I said, when you're doing this stuff, when you're preparing and cutting up the bread, you have been blessed with the opportunity to be a presenter of the covenant, the presenter of the communion, the Eucharist of the Christ. What a blessing that is. And so in our going, let's keep it real simple. John 14th chapter says in this book, one sentence Three words, God is love. If God is love, love is God. If you want to find love, look for God. If you want to find God, look for love. And 
What's the first verse of the song we sang to open the service? You guys sang it up here, uh, Johnny Nash. I can see clearly now. The rain is gone. There are no obstacles in our way. Gone are the dark clouds that had us blind. I forget the other words, but may the light of God shine down upon us. May the light of God shine out from within us and bring us peace. And may we, pray God, bring peace to the lives of at least one person that we touch. Your existence in this moment might be the only gospel someone will ever see or hear. Be peace.